Hi, uh, my name is Jane Ruby and I'm president of the League of Women Voters of Chicago. Welcome to our Chicago in Focus. <laughs> Form civilian district councils and the reduction of violence. We're really excited about this program. This this one, uh, Chicago in Focus, actually jumpstarts our Chicago in Focus series, which will go through the fall, winter, and into the spring. So definitely check out some of our other programming um, this year. So just a little bit about the two uh, co-sponsor organizations before we begin. <clears throat> The League of Women Voters of Chicago is a nonpartisan grassroots organization working to protect and expand voting rights and ensure everyone is represented in our democracy. We empower voters and defend democracy through advocacy and action and education. Formed from the movement that secured the right to vote for women, the centerpiece of the League's efforts remains to expand political participation and give a voice to all Americans. League of Women Voters of Chicago has been at the forefront of the fight to continue and recognize the important contributions of the many women whose efforts have helped make their city fairer, freer, and more just. The League's multi-year effort to honor the legacy of Ida B. Wells, for example, culminated in the 2019 with the renaming of Congress Parkway to Ida B. Mm -hmm. Wells Drive. In December 2020, LWV Chicago celebrated its centennial a momentous milestone for our organization and an opportunity to celebrate the achievements of recent years as well as the century-long legacy. Yet, while we have a lot to celebrate, the centennial also threw into stark relief the work that still needs to be done. LWB Chicago continues to pursue its goals through a range of voter service activities, including voter registration drives, disseminating information for voters, participating in poll watching, and hosting candidates, debates, and forums through education of its members and to the public. Um, in the past few years, LWB Chicago has worked on some inspiring projects, including passing of legislation, turning Cook County Jail into a polling site. Our democracy remains a work in progress. Even if it takes another century, the league will see it through. And so unfortunately, um, unfortunately, uh, Unfortunately, um, Mark Tunney of the Union League Club could not be here for this um, Zoom, so I'm just going to do a brief introduction of our co-sponsor for the Chicago and Focus. Oh, Jane, the Union League Club. Jane, yes. Uh, I'm Jeff Gray. I'm the director oh. for public affairs at the club. Oh, do you want to? Oh, great. Did you want to say? Want to give a little spiel about the Union League Club? Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, Jay, while we're in, while we're interrupting, why don't you make me a co-host and I'll monitor the mutes for you. Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jane, and uh, thank everybody for uh, attending uh, this evening. Uh, this is uh, a collaborative effort between the Union League Club of Chicago and the League of Women uh, Voters uh, Chicago. For those not familiar with the Union League Club, it's been around for um, approximately over 140 years, and uh, the club has been at the heart of Chicago's civic, business, and cultural uh, community for uh, that many years, 140. Um, we are unique among um, uh, private clubs uh, in, the, in, the, in, in regards to um, the public advocacy that we do. We have a public affairs committee uh, that uh, oversees uh, probably around eight um, subcommittees that focus on areas uh, ranging from administration of justice, military and veterans affairs, uh, transportation. Uh, it's a broad <laughs> range of interests and passions that the club members have, and uh, they meet on a regular basis at least once a month and uh, they talk about issues and from uh, the subcommittees, um, they present um, items that they would like the uh, public affairs committee to um, champion. Uh, and then the committee brings that to the board of the union league club. And uh, they decide whether or not to, to really put uh, a bunch of uh, resources behind um, any particular issue. So. Uh, I'm just glad I've been in the role for the last four months, and uh, I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Uh, 
I'm Kelly Kleinman, and I have the, uh, the happy task of introducing this evening's speakers. The first one, Adam Gross, is someone from whom we've heard before, um, but the organization that he leads is sufficiently complicated that we needed to hear from him again. And it is uh, our pleasure to host Adam again. He was appointed in January of this year as the executive director of the Community Commission for Public Safety and Accountability, which is the latest of Chicago's police reform efforts and probably the most serious of them. Uh, Adam is an attorney and policy expert with more than 30 years of experience in developing, advocating for, and implementing structural reforms. He was uh, director of the Police Accountability Project at Business and Professional People for the Public Interest, and in that capacity, worked with um, uh, other organizations that were working on the development of this commission. So he is truly someone who was uh, present at the creation and is now responsible as executive director for implementing the work of the commission, which begins with explaining the work of the commission. And I need to mention that a few weeks ago, I listened to WBEZ, Chicago Public Radio, uh, discussing the commission, and neither the guest nor the host, ordinarily both very well-informed people, had the vaguest notion of the structure of the commission or what it was supposed to do or what its relationship was with the um, uh, COPA, which addresses other versions or other aspects of police accountability. So Adam may be saying something that he said a bunch of times before, but it is not yet, has not yet penetrated the world. We're also fortunate to be joined by Kim Smith, who's the director of programs of the crime and education labs at the University of Chicago, where she works across a portfolio of research projects in partnership with government agencies and local nonprofits, including the League of Women Voters. Her work includes research on innovative approaches for improving academic outcomes on the education side and reducing both violence and the harms of the criminal justice system on the police side. Before she joined the Urban Labs, Kim managed a portfolio of randomized controlled trials testing the effectiveness of financial products at Innovations for Poverty Action in New Haven, Connecticut. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in economics from McGill University, and we are delighted to have both of them here. Adam, you get to go first, and uh, please outline for us particularly the relationship between the district councils for which there are just about to be elections and the community commission, since that seems to be a subject of some confusion. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to uh, uh, to tell the story. Um, I know we live in a city where there are uh, approximately 2.8 million people who know nothing about either of these entities and uh, the people participating in this Zoom meeting uh, may uh, already be among the most knowledgeable people in the city. Uh, and if they aren't already among the most knowledgeable people in the city, uh, surely will be by the end of our hour. So these two entities, the, the community commission and the district councils are created as a result of an ordinance that the city council passed last July. Um, that ordinance really creates a new model for police oversight for police accountability and for public safety in the city. Um, these two bodies are related to one another and serve different functions. The Citywide Community Commission uh, has a bunch of powers, which I'll talk about briefly, um, uh, powers which it can really use to advance systemic reform. The district councils will be elected within each police district in the city and their primary focus is to improve policing and public safety in each district. Although both the community commission, the citywide body, and these local district councils share similar goals in that they're both ultimately about bringing police officers and Chicago residents together uh, to plan 
and to prioritize and to build mutual trust, um, also to strengthen the police accountability system citywide and at the local level, um, and to give Chicagoans, both through the commission and through the district councils, a meaningful role in oversight uh, and in the development of police department policy. And both of the entities uh, are also about exploring and advancing alternative, uh, effective approaches to public safety. So I, I know our focus today is on the district councils, but uh, I'll start by uh, by elaborating on the commission, and then we can talk, uh, as Kelly suggested, about the relationship between the commission and the district councils. So the commission has seven members. Um, they, uh, uh, in the case of the commission that exists today, they were uh, they were nominated by members of the city council, um, and then selected by the mayor. So. City Council had a um, had a an open application process based on people who applied. Uh, the council nominated 14 people. The mayor, uh, a little over two weeks ago, named seven of them to serve on an interim commission. There is going to be a process uh, beginning next year where members of the elected district council will nominate people to serve on the commission and members of the commission will be chosen um, uh, uh, from people who are nominated by the district council so that ultimately members of the commission will have that kind of rooting in the community. So members of the commission serve four-year terms. The commission has to have public meetings at least once a month and it has a number of key powers uh, I'm not going to elaborate on them. I'll just hit on them, and I'm happy to follow up with anyone with um, with details. First, they'll play a really critical role in selecting and removing key public safety officials. So uh, there's a central role for the uh, for the commission to play in choosing the police superintendent and members of the police board. Uh, no one will uh, occupy any of those positions, either superintendent or member of the police board, uh, without first being nominated by the um, by the commission going forward. And the commission has full authority to hire and fire the uh, the COPA chief, that of the Civilian Office of Police Accountability, which investigates uh, the more serious allegations of police misconduct. Uh, the commission can also play a role in removing the police superintendent and, uh, and members of the police board. Uh, and because the commission has the authority to hire the COPA chief, the commission has full authority to, uh, to fire the COPA chief. The commission is also responsible for setting police department policy. Um, there's a significant uh, exception there, which is policies that are covered by the consent decree. So as long as the consent decree is in place, the consent decree has its own rules for, um, uh, for establishing policies that are required by the decree. Once there's no decree, the commission will have uh, authority over all of what the police department calls general orders, which are the higher order policies and all policies have to flow from those general orders. So this is very significant. We're going from a time where the police department has set all of its own policies internally. Um, it could get public input uh, if it wanted, but it wasn't required to. Uh, when it got public input, it could incorporate it or not. Now, going forward, all police department policy um, will require the approval of the um, of the commission, and uh, and the commission will also have the authority to draft police department policy. Uh, that's all supposed to be a collaborative process with the police department. It's not about sort of imposing policy over the objection of the department. And there's a bunch about that collaborative process that's laid out in the ordinance. It's mandated by the ordinance, but at the end of the day, uh, um, general orders of the police department will have to be put to a vote of the commission before they can become uh, official policy. The commission will also uh, every year establish high level goals for the police department, COPA and the police board. And then at the end of the year, evaluate the progress that the 
uh, the police department and COPA and the police board have made in achieving those goals. Um, so it's another accountability mechanism that the, that the commission will have. Again, that will be a collaborative process, but the commission at the end of the day gets to determine what it wants to do. Uh, and that will all happen out in public and can happen with public input. And then the commission has a lot of tools to promote community engagement and transparency, um, not just through its um, uh, uh, mandatory monthly public meetings, uh, through lots of other means as well. And in those public meetings, it's able to do things like require that the police superintendent come in and answer questions in a in a public forum, uh, respond to document requests and things like that. The, the commission has very broad uh, access to uh, to information so that it can be uh, as well informed as humanly possible when making the really significant decisions that it's going to have to make. <clears throat> um, so as I mentioned, an interim commission was established uh, two weeks ago and a permanent commission will be established next year once the district councils have been established and played their role in nominating members of the uh, of the commission. So what are the district councils? Uh, it's interesting having been involved since the very beginning in the um, development of the ordinance and the, and the creation of the commission, so much of the focus of the, of the public conversation has been on the, the commission and its powers. Uh, though in many ways, the district councils are really the heart and soul of the whole enterprise um, and also the entities through which uh, I think it may be possible to make some of the most significant change uh, because the district councils will be working uh, to transform things neighborhood by neighborhood across the city. So district councils will be created in each of the city's 22 police districts. They'll be made up of three people elected in regular municipal elections. So when we go to the polls next February to vote for mayor and aldermen, we'll also all be voting for our district council members. Uh, once the district councils are created, uh, though the, the idea is that they um, they won't just be these three elected people, that a significant role for these three elected people will be to engage tons of people within each police district in the work of the district councils. The notion is that the more people who participate in the work of the district councils, the more effective the district councils can be. Uh, once they're elected, district council members will serve uh, four-year terms. So they'll be elected next February and start their work next uh, next May. And the district councils have a number of key functions, which are which are laid out in the in the ordinance. Um, a primary function is really to build stronger connections between the police and the community within each police district. Um, you know, we've known since the dawn of. Uh, of policing, that policing is um, is most effective and works best when it's rooted in um, a, a real partnership between the police department and people in the community it serves. Uh, we know that we don't have that in uh, in many communities across the city, and a primary function of the um, of the of the district councils is either to to strengthen those uh, those connections or forge them. Uh, district councils will work with uh, district residents and police to solve problems within the district, uh, to set priorities within the district, and to build public safety within the district, all collaboratively between the district council and the police department. Uh, like the citywide commission, they're required to have public meetings at least once a month. Um, and at those meetings, in addition to doing the problem solving and the priority establishing and the building of, of, uh, of public safety, um, there'll be places where residents can come together and raise concerns about policing in the district and, uh, and work to address those concerns. The, the ordinance also names uh, a, a specific thing that the district councils can do, which is um, bring restorative justice practices into the district. 
um, district councils will also be connected to the commission and um, uh, and in a variety of ways uh, inform, shape, and support the work of the commission. So on a regular basis, all of the district councils will come together across the city, uh, try to identify shared concerns and shared priorities, which they can then bring to the commission and, um, and in that way act as sort of the eyes and ears of the commission um, when we were working to develop the ordinance and looked at um, uh, at citywide entities like the commission around the country, a common concern was that too often the citywide entities got sort of too disconnected from what was happening on the ground. And, uh, and so one important function of the district councils is to ensure that the, that the commission uh, that 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 never happens with the commission. That um, that beyond work that individual commissioners will do um, to stay on top of uh, uh, how the work is of policing is happening, um, community by community, block by block. Uh, they'll also get all this input from the sixty six district council members spread around the city. Um, and that will also help to ensure that the that the commission's work is is really shaped by the priorities of people across the city, uh, in addition to just being informed by their um, their knowledge and their concerns. Um, uh, and then, as I uh, as I mentioned at the at the outset, the district councils will. Uh, uh, will be the first step in the process of selecting members of the permanent commission. So uh, once district council members are selected, um, a number of them will come together to create a nominating committee. They'll have an open application process. Anyone in the city who meets the qualifications to serve on um, uh, to serve on the commission can apply. The, uh, the district councils will review those applications come up with a short list of candidates, uh, and then the um, mayor has to choose from uh, from that list of candidates who could reject all of the people on the list, but then needs to get a new list. Um, the notion being that ultimately no one can get on to the citywide commission who doesn't first have the support of the of the district councils. Um, I'll stop there for now um, and would be happy to um, entertain questions um after we've all caught our breath maybe mute there we go sorry about <laughs> that guys this is not my native heat um before adam we ask questions of you like huh um we want to hear from Kim uh, and have her, you know, give us some perspective on what it is that you've described and where it fits into efforts of police reform that are otherwise going on here in Chicago that are going on around the country and, and just give us a feel for how revolutionary this revolutionary sounding thing is. So Kim, if you would take it away. Yes, thank you. Um, Adam is a tough act to follow, but I will do my best. And before I dive in, uh, I do have some slides. I promise I'll be brief though. Um, I do wanna just give a bit of background about the University of Chicago Crime Lab. We are a nonpartisan nonprofit uh, policy lab based at the University of Chicago and we work with the public sector to improve the public sector's response to the dual crises of gun violence and a broken criminal justice system. And to do that, we design, test, and then scale innovative programs and policies and uh, work in partnership with nonprofit organizations and government to make more, uh, to identify and, and then to enact more effective solutions. Um, we, uh, we have done a lot of work in Chicago, but also have a footprint in New York City. And through the course of our, our 14 years in operation have been exposed to a lot of different police reform efforts across the country, including in Los Angeles. 
Um, and I'll, I'll touch a little bit on, on some of what we, we know from the LA experience, but before doing that, uh, I just want to kind of put a few things into context. Um, as I, I mentioned earlier, we are really focused on the dual crises of the broken criminal justice system, which in, involves law enforcement, obviously, and policing, but also gun violence, given how harmful uh, uh, the effects of gun violence are on not just uh, the, the lives and, and families who are affected, but uh, we know, for example, exposure to gun violence reduces young people's ability to achieve uh, in school. We know that gun violence reduces economic activity. Uh, so the ripple effects are, are really quite large. Um, and I think it's important to, when we think about gun violence and homicides, um, most homicides in Chicago and, and nationally are committed with, um, with a gun. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of using those two interchangeably, but in thinking about the progress or the lack of progress that a city uh, of Chicago, the city of Chicago has made over the past, um, uh, you know, almost 200 years. So at the national level, we've made a little bit of progress in reducing gun violence and reducing homicides relative to the 90s. Uh, but I think breaking it out, you can see that that progress has been uneven across, uh, in particular, the big cities. So uh, a few things are, are quite striking about this figure. It's uh, This is the homicide rate in Chicago, New York, and Los Angeles going back to the uh, late 1800s. The first thing that is, is really um, interesting is how similar the homicide rates of these three cities have been for the majority of history. Um, for, you know, uh, since the late 1800s, Chicago and New York and LA have kind of tracked each other quite closely when it when it comes to homicides. There are two points of divergence, however, uh, prohibition and then the current day period. Um, so looking, uh, starting at the kind of peak of the, the homicide rate in, in, three, in the three cities, the early 90s, the crack cocaine epidemic, since then, LA has reduced uh, their homicide rate by about 80%, and New York has reduced theirs by about 90%. Chicago made some progress, uh, but really, um, unfortunately, in the past several years, most of that progress has been reversed. Um, and, but even before that, I wouldn't say that you know 2010 were the good old days in Chicago. We were still stubbornly high relative to cities like New York and Los Angeles, and I bring this up uh, because I think there's a lot that we can learn from those two cities uh, in thinking about how we can both reduce gun violence, reduce the harms of, of, of crime, and simultaneously reduce the harms of the criminal justice system <clears throat> and improve policing. Which brings me to the consent decree. Uh, so I, I think oftentimes people, and, and especially right now, um, there's a very robust conversation about whether you can achieve criminal justice system reform and whether you can you know, have constitutional policing alongside safe and peaceful communities. And I think the experience of LA and New York shows that you can. So a lot, you know, at the same time uh, that Los Angeles was implementing police reforms, uh, largely as a result of um, uh, its compliance with the consent decree, uh, they saw a reduction in their homicides. So fewer people uh, were harmed and they saw an increase in uh, approval ratings. So the, the public uh, approval of the LAPD increased at the same time that they were implementing their consent decree reforms and that homicides were going down. Um, and this is just one data point that we use to, to kind of um, uh, uh, make the point that you can achieve public safety uh, alongside constitutional effective policing. Uh, we also see in New York City, uh, again, uh, at the same time that violent crime rates were going down, um, we see a reduction in the size of the prison uh, and jail population. So it was not the case that New York City arrested their way out of their um, out of their violent crime uh, kind of surge in the 90s. We actually saw um, a reduction in the incarcerated population, again, to kind of underscore the point that we can achieve kind of these dual aims of criminal justice system reform uh, and gun violence reduction. Um, and I, I, so now I'm gonna I, I tee up a few priorities um, that we uh, have identified over the course of, you know, our work in Chicago, but also across the country that we think would be really um, 
uh, important areas for the police, com uh, for the commission, the civilian commission and district councils to really sink their teeth into. Um, and, and these are because they, these are areas that we think have the potential for really outsized impact uh, in thinking about constitutional reform and uh, public safety in Chicago. So the first is training. Uh, I think there has been a lot of talk and discussion about officer training, certainly in recent years. Um, and, and we think that this is uh, an area where uh, policing can be made more effective and fair. But unfortunately, there is just very little uh, evidence about what is effective when it comes to officer training. Um, officers, we know, respond to very high stress calls. They have moments to make decisions that can have life or death consequences and current trainings leave a lot to be desired. They often uh, are not the most engaging. They don't necessarily provide officers with cognitive tools and are more uh, tactical in nature. So things like firearms qualifications and um, the, the kind of use of hands-on training uh, we think is an area that Chicago historically has not really um, been at the forefront of. Additionally, we know across the nation that just the, the sheer number of hours of training that officers receive uh, pales in comparison to other professions. Um, so uh, this is uh, the, the amount of training to, uh, that required in different fields in plumbing, primary care physicians, and then um, in policing uh, in order to kind of certify initially. Uh, when we asked the police superintendent in Chicago how many hours of kind of in-service training he had received post, uh, you know, graduation from the academy, um, up until a few years ago, the answer was zero. They did their firearms qualification, and then that was kind of it. Um, fortunately, the consent decree is requiring at least 40 hours annually of in-service training for Chicago PD, um, which is certainly an improvement. But again, given the kind of high stakes decisions that officers are making on a daily basis, uh, we think the quality of the training is incredibly important and making sure that as the Chicago Police Department is instituting and kind of uh, rolling out new trainings, someone, um, ideally uh, some uh, civilian uh, and resident uh, voice is kind of incorporated into those decisions, uh, we think has the potential to, to save lives. And there is emerging evidence about trainings that are effective. Um, so in a, in, a, in a world where there are decisions to be made about how to spend and allocate those 40 hours, making sure that those decisions are being made with as much evidence and data as possible. I think another area of training that gets less uh, airtime is the training that managers receive. So uh, in, the, in the private sector, uh, I think there is a pretty good recognition that management uh, training um, or just, you know, uh, effective managers um, are important uh, and they result in, in improved outcomes. Um, we have done some research recently that found that the management quality of police leaders uh, varies both within departments and across departments, and that that variation has actually impacted the homicide rate um, in large cities over the years. Uh, we've even looked uh, specifically at the management, um, uh, kind of the management quality uh, within Chicago PD, uh, um, uh, within uh, kind of the police districts in Chicago, and found that different management strategies or approaches to managing uh, police districts uh, accounted for reductions in violent crimes and police use of force on the order of 20 to 35 percent. Um, so management matters is what we take away from that. Uh, and, and management is, um, is, is not something that the field of policing has invested in uh, historically. So one of, the, one of the really exciting initiatives that we're involved with is going to try to understand what aspects of management and leadership training are most important for emerging police leaders. How do you convey those, those, um, those kind of key concepts? Um, and then does teaching uh, or police leaders uh, uh, through structured courses, um, some of these management, management curriculum, um, does that actually improve outcomes? Does it reduce uh, gun violence? Does it reduce police use of force? Does it improve uh, community sentiment and community uh, attitudes towards the police? Um, so again, I think the, the commission, I know there is already a lot on the, on the docket, but we do think that kind of a focus on police management specifically within Chicago 
is again, another really significant point of leverage, especially given some of the research we've done, which suggests that police management in Chicago has resulted in such dramatically different outcomes by district. Um, Adam uh, kind of touched on uh, alternatives to policing earlier, and I, I want to mention a program that is currently um, uh, up and running in Chicago. It is called the Narcotics of, uh, Arrest Diversion Program. So there have, you know, in, in conversations about reimagining policing and reimagining public safety, uh, discussion about what can be taken off of the um, kind of off of the plates of officers and routed to alternative service providers or other responders. And I think there's a lot of agreement that substance use disorder is um, uh, not, it's not an appropriate uh, use of police officer time. Uh, they're not trained um, substance use you know, uh, uh, disorder providers or mental health providers, behavioral health providers. Um, so one of the kind of uh, initiatives that came out of conversations in Chicago was the NADP program, which instead of um, uh, making, uh, instead of officers making an arrest when they come into contact with someone who they believe may be experiencing substance use disorder, they are instead making a warm handoff to a treatment provider. Um, uh, a clinical, uh, a clinically trained uh, a service provider, and they are, uh, the service provider will then do an intake, uh, they'll uh, assess the kind of um, the status of the individual that they're coming into contact with, and then connect them to services, whether it is housing, transportation, if they need a state ID, um, medically assisted treatment, a whole host of, of uh, kind of um, harm reduction initiatives instead of arrest. And this is, as I said, it's up and running in Chicago. We have actually evaluated this program and we found that it actually does connect individuals uh, with substance use disorder to treatment. The take-up rate is uh, quite high. It's as high as individuals who kind of willingly uh, seek treatment themselves. Um, so the, the take-up rate of services is quite high. We see that participation uh, or kind of the, the program reduces the amount of time officers spend uh, processing low-level drug offenses, and it improves public safety. Uh, there was a concern, I think, at the beginning of the program that if officers did not arrest someone um, for possession of a small amount of, of drugs, they would go on to kind of, uh, you know, commit another crime and, and, and that would result in, in kind of more harm down the road, but we're not seeing high rearrest rates or recidivism rates. We're actually seeing a reduction in rearrest rates, uh, which suggests that there is a public safety benefit to the program. And I bring this up as an example of an initiative that is already up and running in Chicago, but that I think could use uh, um, the attention of district councils, for example, it would be, uh, we think it'd be really interesting for district councils to uh, be part of the kind of accountability uh, process. So are officers taking advantage of this program? If they came into contact with 100 individuals who are eligible for the program last month, how many of those individuals are actually being uh, diverted to services instead of being arrested? Um, so we think as part of the, the council's focus on alternatives to policing um, uh, and, and reimagined uh, ways of achieving public safety, programs like this uh, should definitely be uh, part of, of their focus. And then the last thing I will say is, I don't think uh, this is um, going to be uh, uh, controversial uh, among this group, but you know, police departments are not the only public safety actors in our city. Um, and I think increasingly the collaboration between law enforcement and community violence intervention uh, can, can really, um, again, achieve these kind of dual goals of reduced gun violence and reduced harms of the criminal justice system. And we have had the kind of privilege and the honor to partner with many of the CVI community violence groups. They're often local nonprofits who employ individuals who are from the very neighborhoods experiencing high rates of gun violence. Uh, so they're seen as credible messengers and they're able to connect with, with the men and the women and the young people who are themselves at high risk. Um, CVI programs uh, have incorporated elements of cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, mentoring, wraparound supports, uh, relentless engagement, economic stipends, transitional jobs. Um, they take many forms, but what we're seeing increasingly in Chicago is that these programs 
are effective at connecting the individuals who are most likely to be involved with violence to services. Uh, individuals are taking up the program, um, and we also are seeing reductions in gun violence. So uh, in one program in particular, Ready Chicago, we've seen reductions in uh, shootings and homicides, uh, both victimizations and arrests uh, for participants in the program. Um, uh, with about 85% confidence. And increasingly, uh, I think there are concerns that these programs are expensive and uh, we don't have the money, the social service dollars to be able to fund these programs. But with Ready Chicago, we're actually seeing a really impressive return on investment. For every dollar that is invested into the program, society gets back $3 in benefit just because of the reduced uh, incidence of violence um, uh, and, and, and homicides and shootings. So increasingly thinking about CVI programs as a complement to, to law enforcement and into policing in Chicago. And I would be really excited about the role that the district councils and the commission have in kind of fostering increased collaboration or coordination with CVI, um, uh, between CVI and, and policing uh, and police officers. I think over the years, there have been a lot of start and stop fits of uh, partnership between Chicago Police Department and uh, nonprofit organizations doing violence prevention work. So just wanted to mention this as one of the really, um, we think, uh, promising alternatives to policing um, and, and a, and a complement to uh, policing and the work of the commission. So I will stop there. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of questions and I'm happy to, yeah, happy to entertain all of them. There we go. Fabulous. Uh, I'm going to take advantage, if I may, of my position as moderator to ask the first questions. And it's a question um, that, that um, I want to start with Kim on, but I'm sure that Adam will have something to say about it as well. Um, what you're talking about, let me put it this way. How did New York and Los Angeles change the um, the culture of the police department to achieve the good results that they have achieved? And do you think that uh, Chicago has an exceptionally bad culture that will make it exceptionally difficult to make those changes? I realize that's a very broad question, but I think it's it's one that's on everybody's mind. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer it in a few parts. So I do think when we talk, when we compare Chicago to New York and LA, and I show that that graph, people often ask like, why the divergence? And I, I we do think that policing is a really important um, part of the answer. It's not the only part of the answer, uh, but it is one. Uh, the LAPD is a very different department than it was in the early 90s. Uh, in large part, we think due to the consent decree, they dedicated significant resources towards uh, achieving the um, the aims of the consent decree, um, and they also uh, were very data driven. So at the same time that they were starting to enact some of these reforms, they were also uh, doubling down on CompStat, which is a data uh, based uh, management. Uh, approach to management um, where police commanders come in every week and they're held accountable um, uh, for what is happening in in their in their precinct or in their in their district. Uh, we we know the same thing happened in Los Angeles. Uh, we also know that in both cities they did invest quite significantly in community violence intervention. So in, in Los Angeles, they have an initiative called GRID. It's run out of the mayor's office. And similarly, they use data to understand in which neighborhoods is, is violence most concentrated, um, how can we channel investments towards those neighborhoods and then keep track of, of how those investments are performing. Um, and I, I think the kind of uh, intentional um, collaboration between policing and those nonprofit organizations in Los Angeles was quite profound and actually uh, is, is kind of serving as some of the basis for what we're seeing in Chicago kind of in its earliest days. Um, but maybe I'll sum it up by saying that they uh, really prioritize, especially in Los Angeles, uh, resourcing their constitutional reforms, the amount of officers they had dedicated to the consent decree and to constitutional reform implementation more generally, uh, 
at least from what we've seen, is, is, is outpacing where we are right now in Chicago. They use data to drive their decision making on both the policing and the CBI front, and they uh, really emphasized collaboration between law enforcement and community residents, um, uh, both via the police commission in Los Angeles and also the nonprofit organizations who were charged with co-creating public safety. Adam, comment? I think I would just uh, add to what Kim said by uh, hearkening back to something that Kim talked about earlier, which was uh, about training for managers uh, and also training more generally. Uh, LA has invested um, very intensively in training for managers uh, and, uh, and has a system that I think has worked more effectively for promoting people into, into management positions. Um, I've heard a number of people across the country say that um, the, uh, the thing that is really at the core of police reform is middle management. Um, that sounds like the most boring thing in the <laughs> world. Um, and there's a lot that we talk about in the world of police reform that is uh, shinier and seems like a bigger deal. Um, I, I think there's a fair amount of evidence that says if you get everything else about reform right and don't uh, improve the quality of middle management, you can't really do reform. Um, so uh, the kind of work that the crime lab and others are doing to improve training um, for people as they move up the ranks is uh, is really critically important. And I think examining um, uh, how people are promoted and then the support they receive once they're promoted. Um, you know, we, we talk sometimes about about consent decree compliance and uh, and the conversation about the consent decree is often about you know, the number of provisions under the consent decree um, in which the uh, the police department is in compliance. Um, we don't necessarily focus on the elements of the consent decree that are most critically important. So uh, there are a set of provisions that are about training um, that are critically important and should very much be the focus, I believe, of um, uh, our assessment of progress under the consent decree. There's also uh, provisions in the consent decree about um, what's called uh, unity of command and span of control. And I'll, and I'll focus particularly on span of control. So span of control is basically how many people are supervisors supervising. Um, if you go back a number of years before the consent decree, there were supervisors so at, at, at the sergeant level, the, the people who are most responsible for um, officers who are doing lots of the day-to-day -day work of policing, um, there were supervisors who were supervising 25, 30 or more people, um, which is way above uh, uh, the number that's generally accepted uh, in departments around the country. And the consent decree requires that those numbers come down substantially so that supervisors, uh, so that sergeants would be um, supervising generally no more than 10 people. Um, that's a critically important piece of the of the consent decree. Um, and, uh, and the future of reform, I think, is going to depend very substantially um, on the extent to which we, um, we improve middle management. Very good. Uh, there were questions raised about how to raise questions. It's fine if you want to put them in the chat and I will read them. Uh, if you'd rather, you know, raise your hand. Um, I'm not sure that I can actually see everybody, although I can see somebody's hand up. So let me read the first two questions, which I think are, are connected. Um, Rochelle asked, can a council member be selected to be on the commission? Uh, you know, is there a, a promotional path, maybe? And then um, Jenny says, electing 66 new people for the district council for a newly created position, what do our panelists think are the qualities for good candidates in this role? Are we seeing some initial interest in neighborhoods of candidates to run? So uh, I think both of those are primarily for you, Adam. The, um, 
I'm sorry, I've gotten about four hours of sleep since the commission was appointed. The, what, remind me what the first question was. Oh, uh, can a council member be selected oh, to thanks. be on the commission, uh, him or herself? So what the ordinance says is that a, um, a district council member can't serve on the commission, which I would interpret to mean that someone could conceivably begin on the district council and uh, and then be nominated to serve on the commission and serve on the commission, but you couldn't be both a district council member and a commissioner. Got it. Um, and then uh, and then with regard to the uh, the qualities of a good district council member, uh, I'd say one one reason that the uh, so the, the ordinance was really developed by people in communities across the city who um, came together for the purpose of, um, of creating these new entities. And I think the a lot of the logic behind the creation of the district councils was um, this notion that this, this has to be about community engagement, about increasing community engagement and um, uh, building relationships and building trust. Um, so, uh, so one reason to have elected positions, in addition to the fact that it's more democratic, is um, generally people who are able to uh, to get elected are are people who are comfortable going out and knocking on doors and meeting people and encouraging their their neighbors to come out and and participate. So, I think ha having that ability, having that ability to um, uh, uh, talk to people in your community to understand what their concerns are, um, to help them to believe that um, uh, that you understand them um, and want to work with them to uh, lift up their ideas and try to make change within the community and uh, and across the city is going to be um, is going to be critically important. Um, and then I'd probably um, add to that: uh, it would be great to have people who. Um, are curious about this work. This is incredibly difficult and complicated work. And um, uh, I imagine that there is a lot more that the vast majority of people don't know um, than they know. So having people who have uh, a real hunger to learn more, who are comfortable um, asking questions um, and trying to uh, work together with others to um, uh, um, walk that um, path that um, day by day maybe gets us a little closer to some truth uh, would be would be really important um, and an ability to uh, to work collaboratively and to work collaboratively across difference um, with lots of different opinions about uh, about policing and public safety um, people coming to this work with lots of different feelings uh, and ultimately we're all going to have to um, do this work together to move forward. Kim, do you have anything to add? I was actually just going to say, uh, for what it's worth, I also think uh, curiosity and also like intellectual humility is important. Um, uh, those are important characteristics for anyone doing this work. I learn something new every week. Uh, things you know that you may have expected to happen when you look at the data, the opposite is what actually took place. So I think just coming mm -hmm. in uh, with a very curious spirit and mind and being willing to ask questions and um, uh, being willing to kind of interrogate the findings and, and analysis that comes out of, of the policies that are enacted. Um, and uh, yeah, just I, I think humility is incredibly important uh, when it comes to all things criminal justice reform, policing and gun violence, um, and especially so for these roles. Very good. Uh, Sharon, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, I, 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 Go ahead. Yeah, I have a, Take uh, it away. a question. Yeah, a, a question. I've been attending some of the meetings from um, NACOL, the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Policing, and, and they've highlighted two programs. And I'm wondering what you think about those wor the work of those programs and if they're being looked at in Chicago. And one of them is um, EPIC, New Orleans, Ethical Policing is Courageous. And then a similar one at Georgetown, able active bystander training in, in um, law enforcement and basically the, the 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 premise of both of those is that under the pressure of policing it's easy to resort to violence rather than 
you know, more productive forms of intervention. And so if you train people to know that you're likely to respond that way, and they actually train people like where uh, police officers will, you know, step and stop a supervisor, say, hey, Epic, or hey, April, you know, and so it's a kind of way of realizing that with the, the pressures of the job. So what do you think about those efforts? Are they effective? And are they being looked at for Chicago? I um, I'm not familiar with um, with Epic uh, being rolled out in Chicago, but I I believe uh, the Chicago Police Department may be um, in conversation with the folks at Georgetown about bringing Able in, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. I will say that one of the uh, programs that we've evaluated is called situational decision making, and it uh, uses similar principles. So the idea that officers are put into these high stakes situations, they have seconds to make a decision and they may catastrophize or um, you know, think like this person has a gun. Uh, that's like the immediate kind of you know, next thought after being presented with a situation. So it teaches officers to think about their thinking. What are some of the thinking shortcuts that they make? What are some of the thinking traps that they may fall into? And what we've found uh, with situational decision-making is that it is reducing injuries um, to both officers and to subjects. So uh, that has been rolled out in Chicago, uh, and I, I think kind of the, the principles that you described uh, in both EPIC and ABLE seem to be quite similar um, across the three trainings. Oh, absolutely. That sounds like exactly the same. Vanessa, you have a question? Unmute yourself, please. Okay. Yes, I did. Thank you so much. Uh, Kim, I was so glad to hear you talk about the anti-violence community programs as well as the need for changes within the police department itself. That, that's the two-pronged approach that I think is really needed. I work at a school for retrieved high school dropouts. And I know that a lot of the students are just as much concerned about the threat of gun violence from their peers as from the police. The question I have for both of you is, do you see the district councils having the kind of influence they're going to need to make sure that the approach to police reform and gun violence prevention includes both approaches in the police and within the community? Adam, do you want to start? Uh, the uh, the short answer is yes. I mean, that is a Vanessa. What you described is very much the purpose of the of the district councils. Um, that is that is a primary goal, and uh, and the challenge will be to uh, you know to to live up to that vision. Yes, and I would just say, I, I hope so. Um, and, and particularly in thinking about, we've done some analysis looking at youth involvement in gun violence because you know, just the sheer number of youth who are shot and killed every year in Chicago is just so, it's not something that should be happening in our city. Um, so trying to understand what are the different levers uh, to keep young people safe. Um, what we found was that 95% of the young people who are shot and killed every year in the city of Chicago were not engaged or enrolled at school at the time of the victimization. Um, so just that, that I think speaks to the broader ecosystem of supports that's necessary to like keep young people safe within our city, not just police. Um, like the public school system has a, a very significant role to play. Although these young people have decided to disengage from Chicago Public Schools, so what are those other supports and services in their neighborhoods that can meet them where they're at and then reconnect them to school? Because ultimately, uh, a high school diploma is one of the most protective factors against future violence involvement. So it's not just police, it's not just the public schools, it is uh, a broader ecosystem. And I, I really do hope that the district councils are able to kind of tap into that and, and kind of co-create that public safety uh, framework uh, within their respective districts. And, and I just had one one thing, and I, I don't want to get ahead of the commission, uh, certainly, or ahead of the district councils, which don't even yet exist. Um, but I know there are uh, a number of organizations that are very interested in the district councils and are very interested in questions about um, about how to get young people more engaged in this work. Um, and and I believe there have been some. There have been some conversations here and there about about maybe even at some point creating some structure similar to the district councils that might run kind of in parallel to the district councils that would be uh, entirely for young people. Um, so a place where um, young people could get together um, with the same kind of tools that the district councils 
will have uh, as a as a formal way for them um, to engage in and help drive uh, some of this work, as well as being you know opportunities for leadership development. Um, um, and we can all imagine you know a gajillion different ways in which um, in which that could be really really valuable. Catherine, you have your hand up, and your question will be the last one. <laughs> Thank you. And sorry, I unmuted right when my husband was asking me questions about about what's in the oven. <laughs> okay. We well, now you now you have to tell us like what, that. What's, you have to tell us what's in the oven? <laughs> so, um, my question um, is really two part, but I think it'll be short. And on the last one is, uh, we're about you know we're about ready to elect uh, council members for the district council. We're also about ready to elect uh, school board uh, people. We look across the country and we see some kind of crazy people with agendas coming in and running for some of the offices that are similar. And um, the League of Women Voters, uh, we, we need to make sure people are informed. And one thing was to talk about sending out a survey. Um, how are we to vet for the public, uh, you know, we don't take sides, but we do ask questions and try to get answers. How should we help the public vet some of these candidates? Uh, or if you, or, if, you know, with a survey, if you could help us with good questions. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so I imagine it's, it's a great question and I imagine it's a much longer conversation. Um, <laughs> But it it probably gets at you know what are the what are the qualities that are that are most important in a district council member and what evidence do we have that various candidates uh, embody those qualities? Uh, both Kim and I um, uh, talked about some qualities that we think are essential, and and I imagine there's a, a longer list if we spent more time talking about it. But that that sounds like a. Um, a interesting work and I'd be happy to continue the conversation and I imagine their commissioners would be happy to be part of that conversation as well. Kim, anything to add? That was uh, a good ladies and gentlemen, I love that <laughs> thank you, Adam, Kim, thank you so much. It's always illuminating to hear from people who are doing something other than shouting at the TV cameras about how Chicago is a hellhole and it's Kim Fox's fault or whatever. Um, thank you for spending the time with us. Uh, to our audience, thank you all for your attention. This is a hugely important thing that is happening around us. And yet it's something that, that hasn't yet gotten the attention that it needs. So I'm glad if the League of Women Voters can, can take a leadership role in letting people know how much this matters and what great potential it has for improving our city. Thank you all, uh, everybody. Good night. Kelly, can I make one more point, which I would be, um, I would be remiss if we ended without uh, my having said this. So the elections are in February because these are part of um, the regular municipal election cycle. That means that all the requirements uh, to run for office uh, apply to these district councils. And there are people who are interested in serving on district councils who are, as we speak, out gathering signatures um, for the petitions that they'll need uh, to run for office. Those, uh, those petitions are due right around Thanksgiving, um, which uh, feels both a, a little bit in the future and like tomorrow. Um, so the election isn't until February. Lots of work needs to happen between now and February, um, but people who are interested in running um, uh, or people who may be interested in running should be making decisions quickly and, uh, and going out to do the work to um, meet their neighbors and um, hear about their ideas and, uh, and spread the word and, and get petition signed. Good point. And it's always good for a League of Women Voters program to end on a note about campaigns and voting and stuff like that. Thank you all very much. I'm signing off. I presume all the rest of you are as well. Thank you. Thank you. you.